name is Renee Gravel and I'm a partner in the Fargo office. I've been working with the 340B program for a number of years now and also work in the healthcare audit arena. I know for some of you, when I saw the attendee listing, we have done 340B compliance reviews out at your location. So there's my contact information. I think it's also repeated at the end. So to the agenda, some common deficiencies identified in HRSA audits. And the nice thing about this is HRSA does publish all of their audit findings by year of when they initiated the audit. And you can see what the results were. It does have facility names out there. So I know when I was looking at it, I did see some iBailey clients listed there. Also some common deficiencies we've identified in some of those 340B compliance reviews that we have done. Um, many of those are going to be specific to critical access, not exclusive, but many of those are critical access. When HRSA goes in, I have noticed there's more and more critical access hospitals being identified, but oftentimes it would be a critical access hospital that is part of a larger system, and it was maybe the larger system that was selected. We'll also talk about some possible corrective action plan steps. Obviously, anything that's identified as an issue, the corrective action plan would be to fix that, but there are some things that maybe you could do ahead of time to try to avoid if HRSA were to come in any sort of, of finding or something like that. We'll kind of talk about maybe where some of the sources of information would potentially be located. So with some recent legislative developments, obviously um, what's going on in Washington DC and many of the states right now, um, I don't know about you, but I dread watching television because of the political ads that are out there. But there have been quite a few recent developments over the last year regarding 340B. Nothing has been officially passed or officially changed, but it is being talked about a lot in Washington, particularly because of President Trump's comments and reports related to drug prices. And so it is kind of at the forefront of some discussions throughout the DC area. So just a little historical perspective and why kind of the 340B program is getting so much um, airtime right now. The program has actually been around since 1992. So it's been around for quite some time, really didn't hear a lot about it for a really long time. And then in 2009, with the passing of the Affordable Care Act, critical access hospitals were added as eligible participants in the 340B. Prior to that, they were not. It was just certain granting type agencies such as hemophilia clinics, FQHCs, some things like that. And then certain hospitals, depending on the type of hospitals, that met a certain level of DISH, usually you know 8% or 11.75, depending on the type of hospital. But one of the things we have seen is that the number of 340B hospitals, this is not the granting agencies, but the hospitals, has increased dramatically over 46% in the last six years. So there's nearly 2,500, at least as of 2017, that are participating in the program. So this obviously, because there's more people participating or more facilities participating, this has increase the amount of 340B discounts that are out there. The other piece of this is that the discounted drug purchases, it used to be just drugs you used in your own facility. So if you were a hospital and obviously with outpatient because that's what 340B relates to, the only, medic or the only drugs that would be eligible for the discounts were what you used yourself. At some point, the, legis or the regulations were changed and they added contract pharmacy agreements. And this has really increased the amount of drug purchases under the 340B program. And you can see the 16 billion number that um, was estimated in 2016, which is a 400% increase since 09. Two components of that, one, just drug prices obviously have increased during that time frame, and two, it is because of the increase in the number of contract pharmacies, as well as the number of participating facilities with 340B. So in 2016, that $16 billion was estimated to be approximately 5% of the U.S. drug market. So keeping in mind, $16 billion is a big number, but the drug market is much larger if you do the math, that's like 320 billion. So it's a very large number. So that's part of the reason 
that there is so much discussion in Washington. The pharmaceutical companies are talking to the people in Washington about having to provide these discounts. And so it's on the forefront of a lot of people's minds. So a White House comment, and this is coming out May of 18, so pretty recently, President Trump came out with a drug pricing plan. And one of the things that the White House published was saying that some hospitals that receive drug discounts under the 340B program, which is designed to help safety net facilities, do not provide meaningful levels of charity care to low income and vulnerable patients, ultimately pushing up drug prices for patients with private insurance. So when you read that comment, a couple of things kind of jumped out at me when I read it. First, the notion that 340B discounts increase drug prices for privately insured is, is just simply wrong or at the very least oversimplified. Again, because 16 billion, while it's a large number, the total drug market's about 320 billion. So unfortunately, what that kind of tells me is the people who posted this on the White House website really have maybe a misunderstanding of how the program works. The 340B savings side, when you read that comment on the previous slide, really focuses on charity care, or that's what it mentioned. However, that's a very, that's one of the elements that hospitals do with 340B savings. So it doesn't talk about other uncompensated care, underpayments, and then there's a lot of, especially in rural areas, other things that are being done with those savings, which includes the re recruitment and retention of qualified providers, provision of services that might not otherwise be available. Plus, depending on how the, the 340B program is structured, for those that are uninsured or underinsured, there, some of those savings are being passed on to them. So by the White House defining that only as charity care, it's a very limited view of what the savings of the 340B program are doing. So I think it's kind of misleading where that benefit is all coming from. So we're hoping um, that because this program is being talked about and discussed at length in various circles in Washington, D.C., that there will be more education among the people who are trying to make these decisions, you know, staffers or you know, representatives, senators, whomever, so that we can make sure that everybody's understanding that there is more to this than just charity care. As many of us know, or many of you know, the Medicare Part B 340B reimbursement reductions happened they don't apply to critical access market, but this is something that also has taken up a lot of discussion and a lot of time in Washington, D.C. Um, was cut by 30 percent. Um, the American Hospital Association challenged these cuts in May of 18 and requested kind of fast tracking this so that these they could get rid of these cuts. The Court of Appeals, so that was in May of 18, the Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit upheld the previous ruling in early July. So right now, the American Hospital Association is expecting to refile some type of motion to try to remove these cuts. And part of the reason for this is it, we've heard a lot of talk about with the repealing of the ACA. And I know there was a lot of concern, especially among 340B hospitals, well, what does that mean to our 340B program? Because the critical access hospitals came into the program because of the Affordable Care Act. Right now, there's not enough votes in the Senate to repeal the Affordable Care Act because of the supermajority. So the only way they can make changes to the Affordable Care Act is through the budget reconciliation process. And if you really think about where the savings are coming from for 340B facilities, those are being provided by the drug manufacturers themselves, not the government. And so because this is, zero neutral to the government, they can't make certain changes. They can't repeal it. They can't take critical access hospitals out of this as an example because it, it's not costing the government anything. But the government right now is saving because they have reduced the amount they're paying, which was not really part of the original intent of the 340B regulations when they came out in 1992. Back in June, end of June, the Senate Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions, or HELP, held a hearing. Um, the head of HRSA, Dr. Christopher Pedley, actually had 
presented at this or had talked to them. And if you recall, it's the, the super regs that were supposed to be coming out related to the 340B program. And those actually were tabled. They were supposed to come out in December of 2016, immediately after the election. However, one of Trump's first executive orders was if you put new regulations in, you had to take two out. HRSA doesn't have that many regulations, so they weren't able to kind of to do that game. So they pulled those back. But one of the criticisms of the mega regs when they were first in, in the proposed state was that it was really giving HRSA more authority to make changes to the regulations and things that maybe what was actually intended. So what Dr. Pedley had said is that HRSA needs more specific legislative authority to conduct rulemaking for all provisions in the 340B statute. So HRSA is still trying to kind of get some of that control back or, well, control they didn't have in the first place, but control they think they need. Um, and then went on further to say that giving HRSA the specific authority would be more effective for facilitating HRSA's oversight. That has been a significant criticism is that HRSA is not overseeing this program as much as they should. And a lot of this is coming from the drug manufacturers that are providing these discounts. Um, anytime there's this kind of money, $16 billion, it's um, an area that people may try to take advantage of and, and, and are taking advantage of. And we'll go through some of the, the HRSA audits in, in just a moment um, on the results of those. But even though they have really stepped up the number of audits they're performing, if you look at it in comparison to the number of facilities that are participating in the 340B program, it's still kind of like a, um, you know, like getting an IRS audit, you know, what are your chances? And that that's kind of where it is. They have said though, however, one of the things with, with Trump's proposed budget is to have kind of a surtax, a provider tax, to allow more money to go over to HRSA so they can increase their staffing and start conducting even more audits. So HRSA has said, it's not a matter of if we come to your facility, but when we come to your facility. However, at this time, based on this Senate committee hearing, they have not been granted the level of authority, legislative authority that they are really looking to um, get. In June, there was also a GAO report that came out specific to the federal oversight of the 340B contract form pharmacies. And when you say federal oversight or when they say federal oversight, what they're really specifically referring to is, is HRSA. So, which is the Health Resources and Service Administration, who is the one that is supposed to oversee this. What they have found in this report, and it actually was quite critical of the oversight, especially related to the 340B contract pharmacies, was that first, hospital systems are more likely to use them. Some covered entities contract with literally hundreds of individual pharmacies through contract pharmacy arrangements. So that would be what one covered entity would have hundreds of these types of contract pharmacy arrangements. And with the way that that arrangement works, basically that discount that's provided, so say it's a $50 discount, is shared with the contract pharmacy. So it does increase the number of prescriptions that are filled under the 340B program because it, it isn't just the, the prescriptions that are filled at the hospital or the covered entity. And there are actually some granting agencies that own their own pharmacies within their entity and so are, we're already getting these. The average number of contract pharmacies per hospital is 12. So that, that's quite a few. And I know one of the proposed um, pieces of legislation that came in, and I think it's, it's still in the proposal or it may have already been killed. I, I tried to find it yesterday and I wasn't able to, was to limit the number of contract pharmacies that any one covered entity could have. And when I was reading through that some time ago, for most of the critical access hospitals that we work with, maybe substantially all, they're really, the number they were throwing out, um, I believe was 10. 
So most of our critical access hospitals, you know, rural America, there's not that many contract pharma or retail pharmacies in the area. So it's one of those things that it definitely would impact some of the large safety net hospitals, say in New York or LA, Chicago, areas like that, where they do have those hundreds of contract pharmacy arrangements. But for those in, especially in the critical access hospital market, there's, there's just not that many that have that number of contract pharmacies. The report, report further goes on to say that there's a lot of um, lack of guidance. And so it's very difficult for covered entities to try to make sure they're following the rules when the, the rules are, are vague and the rules are, um, and in some areas, they just don't have the guidance. Keep in mind that when the 340B regulations were first proposed in the early 90s, they were never designed to apply to hospitals. It was really supposed to be for certain granting agencies such as the FQHC or FQHC-like facilities, hemophilia clinics, Ryan White, Ryan White AIDS clinics, those types of things. And hospitals were added kind of at the end, right before it was passed. So that is part of the reason why it's so difficult to try to apply the rules because they are not written for a hospital outpatient setting. And that was actually, we can, we can diss on the, um, the mega regs or the proposed mega regs that never were passed. But one of the things that it did do was to really bring the regulations into a hospital setting so that it made more sense and it was more clear on how it really impacts um, a hospital. So what it also talks about is, um, is there a requirement or should there be a requirement to pass on some of the, the 340B savings, like that $50 I was talking about where part of it goes to the contract pharmacy, part of it goes to the covered entity. Should there be a requirement or is there maybe an implied requirement that some of that savings should be passed on to uninsured or low income patients that are filling those prescriptions? Currently, there are certain certain entities, covered entities, will pass on some of that savings. So for example, um, they would only charge the patient the 340B price, maybe the 340B price time, you know, plus some small markup to cover any handling costs. Um, but that doesn't always happen and it doesn't need to happen based on most people's understanding. But the GAO is saying, should it though? And, but the, so the extent and the form of that varied and, they did acknowledge, however, though, in those situations where the covered entity is not passing on that discount to underinsured, uninsured, or low-income patients, that they are providing other types of, again, they focus on the charity care services. So I think one of the items in Trump's proposed budget is to have covered entities require that they report what they're doing with that savings. And I know right now there's always been a, you know, it's 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 out there. We have to be follow or at least documenting internally what we're doing with those savings. And I know some organizations even go as far as any 340B funds they receive through the contract pharmacy arrangements are depositing to a separate account so they can track anything that's spent. But it may be to the point where it's going to become a requirement to do that. But again, the, the fact that the GAO is only focusing on the charity care side of things is somewhat concerning because there are other areas. They also went through, you know, with the increase in the Medicaid managed care plans that are out there, as you know, there is a big provision of the guidance that covered entities are supposed to ensure there are not duplicate discounts with Medicaid. Many of the facilities that we work with that are within the 340B program have carved out Medicaid, which makes it a little easier as long as all of the Medicaid plans are being identified, especially if there's more than one with the Medicare Managed Care, to carve out so that there is just no way that there could be a duplicate discount because the state Medicaid program was getting some type of discount on that medication and the covered entity. So most will carve out. However, there's a great number that do carve in. And when we go through the HRSA audit findings here in a moment, one of the things you will notice is diversion, or I'm sorry, duplicate discount because of 
the Medicaid exclusion file with the state being inaccurate, not followed, or not current is, is one of the top findings that they have with 340B reviews at, or audits at the HRSA level. They also believe, GAO is believing that an overwhelming majority of Medicaid beneficiaries now receive services through the Medicare man, or Medicaid managed care plans. So the fact that there's no guidance on making sure we're, they're not getting duplicate discounts here becomes a huge concern of the GAO. And that is one of the things that the report is really focusing on is letting HRSA know there has to be more specific guidance on how these types of things are supposed to be handled. So the GAO recommendations, which were the same recommendations that various reports have had throughout the years, nothing's really changed a whole lot, especially with the first one, which is increased oversight um, from HRSA. The second is imposed data, co data collection requirements on contract pharmacy arrangements specifically. And this is the one, like I said, the contract pharmacy arrangements right now are, are getting increasing scrutinized because of the dollar amount of some of the revenue that's being generated even with you know the various critical access hospitals that we work with when we look at the the revenue that's coming in from those contract pharmacy arrangements on a monthly basis it's there's many times that really the bottom line the operating income is coming down to what those contract pharmacy arrangements what that revenue is and then more comprehensive auditing protocols. And I think what they're really referring to here is specific to the contract pharmacy arrangement. Again, when we go through some of the HRSA audit results later, what you'll see is that lack of contract pharmacy oversight is becoming a more and more common finding as they're focusing on that, maybe not as much in some of the, I started with fiscal year 15, um, results, but now it's more and more. The other thing that isn't really on the slides, but we'll talk about is because of what they're finding with some of the contract pharmacy arrangements and the lack of oversight and some of the practices that are happening at these contract pharmacy locations because of, you know, maybe not understanding the rule, but also either ignoring the rules, is that many of these contract pharmacies have now been kicked out of participating in the 340B program, which not only impacts the contract pharmacy because they're getting the dispensing fee, but it also impacts the covered entity because they're no longer getting that revenue. So this is something that is, is really being focused on. And the kind of the theme of the report is the GAO has very little patience for the lack of federal guidance that's included. There's a lot of, here's what the expectation is, but not really a set of rules or a set of procedures on how to make sure they're following it. The other piece is to keep in mind, as the covered entity, you're completely responsible for compliance of another entity. And you don't have 100% control, obviously, over that entity. So how do you make sure you get the information you need to conduct your internal audits, that type of thing? and with the contract pharmacy agreements, the actual contracts that are in place, many of them, if they have the 12 required elements that HRSA says need to be in those contract pharmacy contracts, there should be a provision in there to allow access to the necessary information to ensure compliance. However, what we're seeing is that in practice, many times, either the contract pharmacy is not being cooperative in providing the information or the covered entity is simply not asking for it and looking at it. Of course, HRSA did not agree with a number of these recommendations, um, believing that some of these requirements, especially the data collection requirement, would be overly burdensome to the covered entity and obviously to HRSA as well because of the more comprehensive auditing protocols and increased oversight. So it'll be interesting to see kind of where this ends up going now that this report is out there and HRSA is having to address the comments that were made. So the legislature has also been somewhat busy in coming up with some proposals. There was a July 11th hearing of the House Energy and Commerce Committee 
Uh, and prior to that, more than a dozen bills and discussion drafts of legislation specific to the 340B program were, uh, were released. And some of these have very common themes. One is giving HRSA regulatory authority, um, which is what HRSA has requested in that health committee. And, and part of it, if you don't have the authority to make changes or to maybe be the strong arm to this, how, how can you oversee a, a program? So you can kind of somewhat see HRSA's position on that. And then imposing additional reporting obligations on HRSA and the covered entities, simply because more information has to come in is what the belief is, so that they can make sure and you know track statistics, see where trends are going and all those sorts of things. So that's really what those many of the bills have in mind. However, there's a couple that have maybe more far reaching implications and a few of those that are a little more um, edgy, I guess, would be the four listed on this slide. First, the first one would legislatively limit the orphan drug exclusion from 340B discounts. And right now, if something's on the orphan drug list, meaning it's used for a rare orphan condition, but it may also be used for other conditions, basically, especially for, for critical access hospitals, what the rule is if it's on the orphan drug list, you can't get discounts from the 340B program. So as you can imagine, as drug, the drug manufacturers are getting approvals through FDA, most of those drugs, there 50% of the drugs right now being approved are on that orphan drug list. So what this one would say is the only time that the orphan drug exclusion for purchasing under 340B would only be if it's used for that rare orphan condition. So I know there's certain drugs, and I'm, I'm not a pharmacist, but I know there are certain drugs that are used, say, for, um, I think there's like a cancer implication, but it's generally used for rheumatoid arthritis, and it's a pretty expensive drug. But now, because it shows up on the orphan drug list, 340B, does you can't get that discount. But it would be if it's not being used for that, it, only if it's being used for that rare orphan condition, then you can't do it. But if it's used for some more common condition, then you can put it back in. So obviously this is one that the drug manufacturers are not in support of, but this would be a, um, an interesting one if it were to, to come through. The 4392 would basically rescind the Medicare Part B reimbursement cut. Um, this is something obviously the American Hospital Association is completely behind. Um, as I said, that has already been defeated in the court system twice though, so we'll see if that one gets any legs or gets any steam. There was a discussion draft from uh, Representative Burgess which would prohibit covered entities from directly or indirectly through a third party such as a contract pharmacy from charging low income or uninsured persons a price above the 340B ceiling price. So what this one is basically saying is that as a covered entity, you would have to pass on some of that saving. So if you have um, a low income or uninsured person, rather than, as I said, that $50, so maybe you pay a $20, there was a $50 discount, $20 goes to the contract pharmacy, you get the other 30. But that discount would somehow have to be passed on to the actual patient so that you would not see that $30 benefit. Maybe you'd only see a portion of it. You'd still pay the dispensing fee, what have you. Part of the problem with this one is another part of the ACA was that HRSA was supposed to have developed some type of database so that we would know what the 340B ceiling price was. Supposedly this has been completed and it's out there. However, right now it only is being used internally at HRSA and no one else has access to it. So part of this would be difficult because right now people don't know what the 340B ceiling price is. Another one that was a discussion draft from a Republican in New York would adopt a new limited definition of a 340B patient. So this one would even restrict, you know, right now it's outpatient or, or patients of those grantees. Um, it would limit that definition and actually reduce the number of people who would be eligible for 340B discount. So these are kind of on both sides. Some would increase the number of things or number of um, 
the dollar amount of drugs that would be purchased, others would decrease. So it's kind of on both sides. So it'll be interesting to see where, where some of these play out as they go through Congress, especially with the election next week. So if you look at both the 2018 budget and the 2019 proposed budget, 340B actually is used as a term. I mean, the budgets are 160, 150 pages long, but if you look at it, 340B is actually mentioned. Um, some of the language is very vague, which is very typical of the budgets, but I think even the bigger complication is we are very unsure of how this would be implemented. So the first one there is, targets 340B hospitals by rewarding hospitals that provide, again, we're on this charity care limitation. So it just is talking about charity care and not the other things that are done with 340B savings. And reducing payments to hospitals that provide little to no charity care. So there's some type of a, a pool out there, not sure where that is coming from. And by rewarding hospitals and reducing, we're again, not sure how the mechanism of how this is going to be implemented. But part of the concern is, again, it focuses on that concept of charity care and really doesn't bring in the other things that the savings are, are being used for. It also pushes for the requirement that hospitals report how they use the savings from the 340B program, um, keeping in mind, how do you quantify that? So you get the revenue um, from a contract pharmacy arrangement. You would have information on the cost of the drugs that were purchased and replenished for the contract pharmacies, as well as the dispensing fee that was paid. But if you're also using 340B drugs internally for your patients in the emergency room or, or an outpatient setting, th that is not tracked in your general ledger. So if it's a drug that was $200 that you were able to buy for 140, all that's being reported in your general ledger is the $140 you paid for it. So trying to make sure you're capturing the 60 as well would be difficult and then so now you have a dollar amount and then making sure you're reporting how you're using the savings. Again, there's such a focus on the charity care side of this. It's, it's very concerning that right now there's just no recognition that there's other things being done with these savings other than the charity care side of it. And then also for those facilities who you know, are kind of nervous about spending the earnings. So they have this, this pool of money in a separate account when they get it from the contract pharmacy arrangements. You know, I don't know that using the savings to set up a cash account would be really something that a facility may want to report. So we'll have to, uh, you know, really find out what do they expect for the savings, what type of reporting, what, you know, again, they're focusing on charity care. So is it acceptable to say we're using it for recruitment and retention or we're going to have a, you know, mammography clinic and only charge patients X because the rest is gonna be covered with 340B savings to make sure that more people come in for it or, or what have you. So it'll be interesting to see if this all comes to fruition and how, how they implement. And then number two, what they define as eligible for the savings. Even yesterday, President Trump had come out with something relating to lowering drug prices. So a direct quote from him is, one of my greatest priorities is to reduce the price of prescription drugs. In many other countries, these drugs cost far less than what we pay in the United States. That is why I've directed my administration to make fixing the injustice of high drug prices one of our top priorities. Prices will come down. So this is a focus of them. Um, part of when you look at some of the history behind it, you see, um, you know, there's the generic discussion comes into play right now. The FDA has been um, told or given different parameters so that they can try to get approvals through more quickly because there's drugs that are being developed that are being used in other countries that have not passed FDA approval in the United States yet. So we hear about this um, a lot and it's almost daily. It seems like I'm getting an email about 
what's happening with with reforms to drug pricing so and even if you look at what medicare pays for medications and all of the other insurance companies it's a it's a huge concern because of the fact that oftentimes a drug that is purchased in the United States, the same drug is purchased in another country and, and the price is significantly lower. One of the other thing the budget is looking at doing is repealing and replacing, again, that's the only way they can do it, um, parts of Obamacare and reducing the state gimmicks, which is one of the things they're referring to as that provider tax that 49 out of the 15 states have. So where there's a tax paid in, and then there's a federal match, and then it's redispersed to the to the um, various facilities. So again, interesting to watch where this kind of goes because many states do have the provider tax type arrangements, and to see what the what the federal government is is going to to do with that. So that all impacts everything that that's happening at that facility. So. Now we're gonna move into some common deficiencies identified in HRSA audits. And the way that I had done this was, as I said, there were, um, there, this is published. And I think actually we might be doing a keyword. Yes, we will. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yep, time for our first keyword of the day. So the first keyword is health. Once again, the first key word is health. Okay. All right, hopefully everybody has that written down. So as I said, HRSA has tracked the audits that they have done and the results of those audits for many, many, many years. So what I had done was basically go out to the website and figure out what types of deficiencies had been identified in HRSA audits. And keeping in mind that some of these take a very long time to settle. HRSA comes in, you'll get a notification, usually you'll have 30 days. Um, they will set up a date. It's, it's not like your financial statement audit. You don't get to say, oh, I'm not gonna be ready then. Can we move it back a week? And then they'll also send out a request for information they're going to want ahead of time. And then somebody's on site, um, one or two people for a couple of days, asking questions, doing the testing. And then they can take, as, as near as I can tell, as long as they want, um, to come up with, with a report for you. And you get the report at some point. Of course, you have, depending on the, the situation, 30 to 60 days to respond to this. And then if you had to develop a corrective action plan, HRSA would have to look at that, maybe make suggestions on changes, um, suggested steps or procedures, send it back. You might have some back and forth with that. But so it doesn't show up on the HRSA website until it's all that part is all done. You might still be under the corrective action plan because sometimes that might take, you know, 12, 18, 24 months for you if you had a deficiency that was was more egregious or more serious to demonstrate that you have now come into compliance with that. So there might be some additional reporting you need to do. So some of them still may say pending, but once you've gone through all the back and forth of we have, these, these were the findings, here's what we're gonna do about it. One of the things that HRSA has started doing, especially with the corrective action plan, is they, it used to be kind of give us a corrective action plan. And then there was a lot of back and forth because it really wasn't in the format that HRSA wanted. They want measurable goals. So it's not just we'll fix it. It's here's how we're gonna demonstrate we fix it. Here's the reports we're gonna provide to demonstrate we fixed it, that type of thing. So now what HRSA does is they'll actually kind of send in, almost send you a full fill in the blank. Um, here's what we found, some suggested procedures maybe, so that it, it's a little more tailored. So hopefully reduces some of that back and forth to try to I, come up with a corrective action plan that HRSA will accept. So 
when I went through, I went back to 2015 and basically went through and identified what, how many entities had been audited and, and had been finalized. So some of these may change if there's still kind of some going through that back and forth, which you'll see in 2018, their information because the number of audits is a lot lower than it really is because many of them have not been finalized yet. And identified what findings were they coming up with now, several facilities would have five, six, seven, eight findings. And actually, in one of the years, one of the facilities was completely removed from the 340B program because of the number of findings that were, were found. Um, in other cases, contract pharmacy arrangements um, or the contract pharmacy, the retail pharmacies were um, kicked out of the program basically and, and precluded from participating in the 340B program. So they do have some pretty good weapons in their arsenal on what they can do if you're not following the, the compliance rules as they are set out. So let's look at what some of those common deficiencies are. Now this one is, is just an oversight of the last four years, keeping in mind 2018 would only include those that have been finalized, um, even if they're still providing information on ongoing compliance, but the, the corrective action plan has actually been accepted. So you can see there's been, for the, the three years, 15, 16, 17, right around 200 audits a year. Um, 2017 could have a couple of more that are coming in if they were done near the end of 17 and they're still kind of ironing out some of the corrective action plan information. As I said, even though you may have only 30 to 60 days to respond to the report when it gets to you, um, HRSA, has more time than that to get it to you. So some of the 2017 audits that were done near the end of 2017, if HRSA had only gotten the information to you late, you may still be in that kind of negotiating stage on the corrective action plan. But you can see duplicate discounts diversion are, again, two of the biggest items that are out there. And we'll kind of go through what some of those are, but quite a few in that area. The database er errors, um, again, quite a few of these, they they're seem to be getting a little bit better, um, but a lot of that has to do with there's changes in the authorizing official or the primary contact, addresses aren't correct, um, contract pharmacies have terminated but they're still listed you know just a whole host of things where just the database itself is not correct the contract pharmacy oversight comments the, i point those out specifically simply because in those cases and also with diversion because that's a lot of times the contract pharmacies were identifying things as 340b eligible when they were in fact not that's the two areas where contract pharmacy, the retail pharmacies will be precluded from participating in the 340B program. And as I was looking through the information, as I said, it's specific by entity name and location. It's across all states where I'm seeing um, retail pharmacies that were precluded from participating in the program. So it is quite a few. In the other category, things that are included there, there were some that no longer met the DISH requirement if they weren't a critical access hospital. Um, so they had the 8% or 11.75% they had to maintain, had no longer met it based on their most recently filed cost report, but did not remove themselves from the 340B program. So there were some of those which obviously resulted in significant paybacks to the manufacturers because you are not entitled to those discounts. There were a couple for um, failure to maintain auditable records. I will say that the one hospital that was um, removed from the 340B program, that was really the primary finding and the primary reason they were no longer able to participate in the 340B program because they couldn't even audit the records because the records were so poor. So you can see in 2015, there were 351 findings in the 201 facilities that were audited. Again, keeping in mind, some of these may have one finding, some may have three, some have as many as seven or eight findings. Um, 45 of the facilities, however, had no findings. So 
those are the ones you want to look at. I did notice um, some of the critical access hospitals that I Bailey works with were some of the ones listed as no findings. So we do look at that just as a heads up when we're doing audits. In 2016, of the 200 audits that were done, 275 findings were, were identified. Um, the duplicate discounts kind of remains about the same. Diversion remains about the same. The database errors kind of, it, it, it's a little bit all over the place on where things happen. 61 of the facilities had no findings in that year. So that was good to see that there was a, an increase in the number that had no findings. 2017, again, another increase up to 69 facilities of the 199 that had no findings, um, but an uptick in the number of database errors that were identified. So for 2018, if we look at that, there's just some couple of things, just words of caution. First of all, the 48 that had no findings, there's probably a couple, you know, some more that will come in. But my guess is the ones that aren't finalized yet are probably not finalized because they're still working through a corrective action plan because of various findings that had been identified. So my guess would be that the number of findings right now at 150 is going to increase into you know maybe another 100 more findings once they start finalizing some of those. Um, hopefully there'll be some more with no findings, but generally the ones that have no findings are going to obviously close much more quickly because um, there are no findings. All of this information was last updated on October 22nd of 2018. So it's relatively new information. Um, and for 2018, we'll likely see more coming through. So if we dig down a little bit into, we'll start with the first line, the duplicate discount. So again, this relates to that the 340B program should not allow a Medicaid patient or a drug that was provided to a Medicaid patient to have discounts both at the state Medicaid level, because a lot of state Medicaid programs already have their own arrangements with pharmaceutical companies to get discounts, and another discount on 340B. So that one of the main premises, one of the, the most important things to be looking for is to avoid duplicate discounts. Again, many of the facilities we work with right now would are carving out Medicaid. However, not all drugs are covered with the contract with the state. So we have seen more and more of the critical access hospitals looking at, is it in our best interest to carve in for Medicaid work with the state Medicaid programs to identify in that Medicaid exclusion file which of the drugs are already getting a discount and then try to obtain the, the discounts on the other drugs under the 340B program. So, but the majority, so of the, you know, each year, not counting 2018, it was kind of in that 60 ballpark, 60 to 68 ballpark of the duplicate discounts that were identified probably a good 65% of them related to not following or improper information in the Medicaid exclusion files because those contracts are constantly updated. So for some reason, if you're not following, basically what that would mean is it was identified as a drug that already is getting a discount through the Medicaid program, but it was still being allowed to go through the system, you know, whether you, whatever 340B kind of software you're using as appropriate to get a 340B discount when it should have been excluded or it just hadn't been updated. So if that's something that your particular organization is looking at doing to carve in for Medicaid, a couple of things. Number one, you want to do some research to make sure, you know, if 98% of the drugs that your providers generally would prescribe are already on the Medicaid exclusion file, you know, there's probably not a lot of money to be had by carving into Medicaid, plus it is going to increase the compliance risk of, of something getting through that shouldn't. Um, so you want to look at that, plus keeping in mind that number two, you need to increase your compliance efforts because when things are on both, you just have to make sure that your software is being updated so that the contract pharmacy, your internal pharmacy, if you're if that's the case, know which 
drugs are already getting discounts at the state level. Other findings related to this is that they basically, HRSA would come in and say, you know, we didn't find any duplicate discounts in the ones we tested. However, based on your policies and procedures, that was just kind of luck. Maybe you do carve out for Medicaid, um, but there really aren't any controls or any testing that you're doing to ensure there weren't any duplicate discounts. And then the other one is that if you do have a if you do carve in for Medicaid and your contract pharmacies are billing Medicaid um, or identifying that those are eligible, you have to make sure HRSA is aware of that. So that was the other finding. But again, the majority of the findings relating to the duplicate discounts did relate to that Medicaid exclusion file either not being followed or not being complete. So then there would be medications that were identified as 340B eligible for a Medicaid patient that should not have been. <coughs> so the next item is, whoops, went too far, is diversion. So that basically is defined as a 340B discount was taken on a patient that was really not eligible for 340B discount. So when we look at those, again, that one was kind of in that 115 ballpark, except for 2018, of all the findings were related to diversion. So by far and away, the most commonly identified one not necessarily every year, but most years, has to do with diversion. So what this relates to, now if you think back to even your own facility, you'll have you know, your main hospital. If you have a, a rural health clinic, that's a reimbursable cost center, um, that's eligible. And maybe you have different sites, child sites, that are part of your organization where outpatient services are performed. Those would be eligible as long as they're listed on the HRSA database as an eligible child site. But with diversion, most of the findings were really in the, the prescription was written at, you know, maybe not at your main hospital, but at another site that was ineligible. It was not a rural health clinic um, that was listed as a reimbursable cost center, but for some reason it was identified on your on the database as being eligible and it really shouldn't have been, so it was incorrectly identified or it was identified as one that shouldn't have been. So that accounts for 60 to 65 percent or more of all the diversion findings in a given year that the prescription was written at an ineligible site. So that is something to really focus on, making sure the database reflects the child sites appropriately, the parent site appropriately, and that you're checking your Medicare cost report to ensure that it is a, an outpatient reimbursable cost center. If it's not, it's not eligible. And we did work with one facility where the clinic, all prescriptions that were written out of the clinic were identified as 340B eligible and they should not have been because it was a non-reimbursable cost center and that had gone on for a number of years. So it, it's very easy to kind of do the same as last year type of mentality, but really taking a good look at that and ensuring you are eligible in each of the locations. And if you're not, to make sure those are specifically excluded so that any prescriptions written out of that site are not identified as 340B eligible. Many reports within your 340B software, location is one of the areas that is one of the um, things that can be identified. So somehow, you know, numbering the eligible locations. And so if a prescription comes in that is from location four and location four is not eligible, the system will trigger that this is not a 340B eligible drug is very important. The second most common finding with diversion was not properly accumulating the 340B drug dispenses. So whenever a 340B drug is prescribed and used, it should in, in the system say, yep, we have one of, of drug A that can now be purchased at the 340B discount. And once it usually accumulates to whatever number, there's an automatic order that goes in to order, you know, if it's 20 units of, of that drug. A couple of reasons for not accumulating appropriately has to do with the unit of measure. Um, you know, is it is it you know number of 
pills at five milligrams or maybe it was accumulating at 10 or vice versa. So it really has, you know, you have to look at that and make sure the pharmacist is looking at that, that it's set appropriately on the most common way of dispensing. Um, and then if not, you know, make sure there's mo the multiple indices are being addressed. Um, some it was, you know, we see some places, especially internally for the own, their internal drug purchases, it's being tracked on an Excel spreadsheet rather than in some sort of software that is uploading. And that can also cause problems with the accumulation. Another one would be how do you handle something if the situation changes. So if a prescription was presented, say, to a contract pharmacy on November 2nd, today, that was 340B eligible because it was a self-pay patient, but they were Medicaid pending, and then, you know, a week or two down the road, that is approved and it goes back retro to November 1st. Well, now that should not be eligible for 340B. So how does the system kind of negatively dispense that? So if you're, the accumulator was at nine, now it should be at eight. So it's really making sure that the system is sophisticated enough to identify the accumulations. And again, that was the second most common finding of those nearly 110 each year that were identified. So other common findings that we saw was that the drugs were being used for inpatients rather than outpatients. And, and in, in my opinion, the number of times we saw that was much higher than I would have expected it to be or not supported by the medical record. We, we see this sometimes in with refills is, is one of the areas where when we're doing 340B compliance reviews where we'll see this, where a physician calls in a refill and it doesn't ever get into the medical record that this refill had been approved. Um, and so when we're looking at this script was filled on November 2nd, but the actual prescription ran out on, you know, September 30th, and then there somehow the physician note for the refill doesn't get into the chart. An ineligible provider, um, and this can happen with specialty um, physicians. We see it in some communities where maybe there's a hospital covered entity and there's also maybe an FQHC in the community as a covered entity, one a grantee, one a hospital, and maybe a physician or a, a provider goes between the two is making sure, especially on that contract pharmacy, if there's contract pharmacy arrangements, that somehow it's identifying which location was this filled at or was the, the visit from so that it's accumulating it correctly for the contract pharmacy. Or no documentation of a provider relationship with the patient. And that's, that's very important because that is in the regs that you have to have the medical record and you have to have some type of notation that you have a relationship with the patient. And some of the times where this comes in, and again, the mega guidance would have changed this and made it more difficult, but since that never came through, is if you are a rural provider, critical access hospital, but maybe you do some infusion type therapies for chemotherapies or that type of thing. Maybe the patient went to a different, to an oncologist somewhere else, got the diagnosis, they prescribe the meds, but it comes back to your facility to do that. As long as there's ongoing documentation of a provider relationship, whether it's, you know, uh, internal medicine doc or whoever, family practice, who is providing that care, that there's notes in there. Yep, we got this information, we're still doing the care. So you need to make sure that the medical record is supporting that there's a relationship with that patient. So. Again, these are the two top ones that are two of the three top ones, duplicate discount diversion and where the, um, um, what you need to do. So again, when you see these, what's your action plan is to make sure you're doing what you need to be doing. Database errors. And I know for a lot of the clients we've worked with with 340B compliance reviews, I'm sure when you see that report that says this address doesn't agree to the address here. So your contract shows this address or maybe your website shows this address for a rural health clinic or this out of the other thing, but it doesn't agree to what the database has. This is one of the things they identify in the, the HRSA audit if, if these don't agree. And part of the reason for that is the regulations say, especially with a contract pharmacy, 
that if the ship to bill to isn't the exact address, they don't have to actually, the, the drug manufacturer doesn't have to ship the drug. So the most common database error was that offsite outpatient facilities were either not listed or were not listed appropriately. And if that's the case, oftentimes what's gonna happen then is you're gonna have diversion because as you recall in the previous slide, the top diversion was that a prescription was written in an ineligible site. So it could be such a thing that, you know, the site quote unquote was eligible, but if you don't have it listed correctly on the database, it becomes ineligible and then that leads to the diversion. So this is, is very important to be going through what's on that database to make sure that it's correct. This one was kind of surprising to me, the second most common database error was that covered entities were registering a contract pharmacy on the database, and which means that a drug manufacturer would see that out there and then have the ship to bill to situation with contract pharmacy, but they actually did not have an appropriately signed agreement with the contract pharmacy. And as you remember, there's, you know, 300-ish or so findings, if you kind of average, not counting 2018, of those findings in any given year, there were probably 10 to, or I'm sorry, 15 to 30 of them that were specific to the contract pharmacy. They did, there was not a signed agreement at the time that the contract pharmacy was added to the database. So it's very important to not add that contract pharmacy to the database until there is a fully executed contract. Um, this one, relatively easy to make sure you're in compliance with, but you do need to recognize it and not add that contract pharmacy until such time as the contract is all signed. The Another common database error, the first one was that it, the outpatient facility was not listed or not listed appropriately, and this one was just that an ineligible site was registered, so maybe it's a non-reimbursable clinic um, was listed as eligible so an ineligible site. So again, going through, you know, don't make assumptions on the cost report, go and check and make sure that it is listed appropriately. The other one, which is actually, if you add them all up, it's the highest one, but there's, you know, a hodgepodge of items that are going into this last bucket on this particular slide. Many database findings for incorrect authorizing official, incorrect primary contact, email addresses being incorrect, which is important to make sure that your policies and procedures will address that. What happens when there is a change in that position? Because when it comes time to recertify each year, the email reminder that goes out that says you need to recertify between this date and this date will go to your authorizing official and primary contact. So if both those positions have turned over, that email may go to nobody or bounce back and they're not going to try to find who it should be at your facility. So it's making sure those get updated. Errors in addresses. And this is one where because of errors in addresses, they have precluded certain contract pharmacies from participating in the 340B program because they weren't listed. The right address wasn't listed correctly. And the number of times that I see when I'm going through some of these where, you know, it's 410 4th Street versus 410 4th Avenue, See, in, in in a small town, you would think, or a smaller community, you can maybe identify those more quickly, but we see them time and time again where those addresses don't agree. So really easy fix. Go through, make sure the contract with the contract pharmacies and the contracts you have, what you've put on your your hospital's website for address and locations, and what HRSA has on their information all agree and if not, make the appropriate changes. So with the HRSA audits, what we're really seeing is that contract pharmacy oversight is becoming more and more critical. Um, the GAO report has only kind of heightened that even more in the minds of HRSA. Um, they know the government's looking at it. Um, we, as I said, I've seen all over every state, it seems like that there have been, or nearly every state, a retail pharmacy that has been forced out of participating in the 340B program because of the deficiencies. Um, other findings, as we said, maintaining um, auditable records, violation of the orphan drug exclusion, 
no longer meeting dish requirements. We see GPO, um, group purchasing, doesn't apply to critical access hospitals, would apply to larger hospitals that you can't purchase 340B discounted drugs and get a group purchasing discount. So um, just a whole host of things. So it is very important, and I think it's also a good idea to kind of look at from time to time, what is HRSA finding? What are they focusing on? We really hadn't seen them focusing a whole lot or even asking about, for example, what are you using the savings for? However, in more recent contacts with facilities that have been audited by HRSA in the recent past, that is something they're now asking. So I think it's kind of setting the stage for making that more of a reportable item. So, you know, it continually changes too. So about the time you think you got it figured out, they're going to make a change to it. So important to kind of know what they're looking for and making sure you're, you're focusing on those. So now we'll kind of go through some common deficiencies in what I. Bailey has found, but I think we have our second keyword. We do. So the second keyword is care. So once again, the second keyword is care. So I. Bailey has been involved in 340B compliance reviews um, for a while now. And what we're going to go through is kind of some of the, the common deficiencies. And I know some of you um, have, have been involved in these. But what we look at, there are basically 12 compliance elements. 12 is kind of a common number with the HRSA with HRSA. There's 12 compliance elements that they look at. There are 12 elements of a contract pharmacy agreement that need to be included. Um, these 12 compliance elements, when you do your internal auditing of the 340B program, these should all be covered at some point. Maybe not every, if you're doing quarterly audits. You don't have to go through each of these every quarter but you would want to make sure they're being addressed at some point during maybe an annual type of a review. So when we look at the 12 elements of compliance, um, we have management. What they're really looking for there is management setting the tone that compliance is important with the 340B program. Does management, especially CEO, CFOs, you know, maybe COO if you have that position, you know, they don't have to be necessarily experts, uh, unless you're the only person, of on the 340B program, but is there at least an understanding of what the 340B program is and for sure an understanding of how critical compliance is to the program? Enrollment, what, what they're referring to there is, are they properly enrolled? So that would be all of the information that's on the HRSA database. Are the addresses correct? Are all the contract pharmacies listed actually ones that have active contracts? If anyone has been terminated, you know, maybe you had a pharmacy in town that closed, is it identified on the database as now it was terminated on you know October 31st 2018 the annual sort of rea the certification on an annual basis all of those types of things or if there's a change so for example your primary contact changes or your authorizing official changes how do you make sure that gets updated and how are you tracking that information so whether you know you're taking a screenshot and saving it each time you're making changes or <coughs> excuse me whatever or what have you so that's what they're really looking for there the policies and procedures and even though we don't specifically see any on the HRSA website referring to policies and procedures what that is coming through as oftentimes on the HRSA audit would be you know non the accumulations not working for diversion or there's really no internal control set up related to tracking diversion or duplicate discount because where those are coming from would be from the policies and procedures so there is an organization apexus it's apexus.com apexus.com and i think it's in the materials later that does have sample policies and procedures they have a whole host of information out there and they have one specific to critical access hospitals they do not want you to take that and just 
you know, file save as XYZ critical access hospital because it includes all policies, all situations that may or may not relate to your facility. So they do want you to go through and, and tailor that to your specific situation. So for example, on some of it with you know, do you have an interface to your 340B software or is it a daily download? Um, I use those terms interchangeably, but in talking to my IT friends, they're not. So it's very important to make sure that's all understood. How are changes made, change management, all of that type of thing is gonna be specific to your organization. So making sure those are all reflective. And if you haven't done an update of your policies and procedures, you know, for a couple of years, the Apexis website template for critical access hospitals, I think it was sometime in 2016, it was updated. The template they had out there prior to that date was not very good. It, it was very disjointed. It, in my opinion, missed several key elements of these 12 elements of compliance. The new one or the newer one that was from, I think, 2016, is is much more comprehensive it's including what's supposed to be included to make sure you can comply with these 12 elements of compliance so if you have not done a thorough review of your policies and procedures since 2016 i would recommend strongly recommend you go out and take a look at that and and look at it critically one of the things we do see is especially with the inventory because for example a lot of fqhc's or organizations like that, the granting agencies, will order 340B drugs and have them in a special location in the pharmacies that they themselves own. So they do have 340B inventory on hand. Um, a lot of times we see with critical access hospitals because oftentimes they're working on a replenishment system or even some of the smaller PPS hospitals where they dispense their, their own drug first or the contract pharmacy dispenses its own drug first and it's replenished with with medications or purchased at the 340B price once the accumulator gets to a certain level. But because of the fact that sometimes things can change or maybe there's an error um, with the accumulator, with the, the unit, how the unit's described, any of those sorts of things, there are times that even though you're on a replenishment system, you could potentially have inventory on hand even if it's a virtual inventory so there should be some type of policy and procedure related to what your policy is when or if that happens human resources is really referring to um, job descriptions it, for people who work with the 340b program obviously pharmacy pharmacy techs um, or anyone else if you have you know your it person is helping with that interface um, upload whatever or your cfo or your accountant who's approving invoices or looking at the invoices, anyone who's kind of involved in the 340B program should have an element of understanding the 340B program in order to do their position in their job description. So those are also provided on the Apexis website. Audits is a big one. And this is one that we have seen um, a, a, an improvement in in the last couple of years compared to when we first started doing these we'd ask for documentation of the internal audits and would not no one would be able to produce anything because either they weren't doing audits internally or the pharmacist was taking a look at things and I used air quotes you couldn't see um, but there was no documentation of that and so really it's making sure that what you're doing is auditing systematically, keeping documentation. So there, there's maybe a set plan. So maybe on a quarterly basis, you're going to look at X number of transactions or X percent of transactions that were purchased under 340B for your internal 340B medications. Same thing for each of your contract pharmacies. We've seen where we'll use a percent of the prescriptions, say quarterly, or a minimum of, of why if there weren't, wasn't that much of activity or that type of thing, and keep track of those. A lot of them are doing screenshots or something like that, keeping it electronically, but some way of identifying, here's what we audited, here's what the results were, and here's what we did because of what we found out. So I, I generally will say to, to people who are on the 340B program, you know, having a mistake isn't, isn't fatal. 
it is, okay, yep, we found it, we fixed it. And that, that's really what HRSA wants to know if they come out there is we have a, a plan in place to try to find anything that maybe got through that shouldn't have, and here's how we fixed it. So making sure you're maintaining that audit documentation is important. The other piece, if you do have contract pharmacy agreements, if, if you actually read the regs on the audits, the internal audits, it, it's almost the way it's wording, worded. It, you could conclude it's kind of a, considered almost a best, pra best practice for the internal audits. However, the language for the audits of the contract pharmacy arrangements is much more strong to where it says HRSA's expectation is that there are audits done on a periodic basis or some type of language like that. So it is much more um, specific related to the contract pharmacy arrangements to make sure those are being looked at. What they're referring to on the contracts is the contracts with your 340B software vendor and or your contracts with your contract pharmacy arrangements. Any contracts related to the 340B program should be reviewed at least annually. Um, need to have the 12 elements of compliance for the contract pharmacy agreements, and there has to be evidence of that review. So simply saying it was reviewed, there has to be some type of evidence in the minutes of, you know, maybe you have a 340B compliance committee or something like that. Orientation and training is referring to anybody who starts at your organization who is going to be involved in the 340B program. How are you making sure they're getting trained? from the orientation standpoint, and then from a training standpoint, and on-the-job on training is fine. You just have to identify that and, and make sure that it's somehow being tracked. Um, and then for your people who've maybe been there a little bit longer, how do you make sure they get um, informed of any changes with the 340B program, and that you know continual training is important. Again, the Apexis website does have 340B University. There are various um, seminars out there and things that you can go to. We talked about inventory already a little bit. Again, many of the critical access hospitals will have a virtual replenishment system, but it's still making sure you have your policy and procedure to explain what you're gonna do with that. Patient eligibility, and a lot of that's gonna come down kind of that interface or the upload, making sure it's an outpatient um, of the facility. They had a service at the, the time when the prescription was ordered and that you have the medical record to support that. The providers, the eligible providers, this is one area we do see some issues, especially in critical access hospitals, because there's just not a lot of um, providers coming in or providers going out, is to make sure that there is some type of review of the provider list that's included that is provided to your 340B software vendor to make sure that if people, if a provider has left, that they're removed from that so they're not continually um, being identified as um, 340B eligible. We did have a situation like this where Walmart was a contract pharmacy and a provider left and went to a community maybe, you know, 35, 40 miles away. The, the Walmart was in a larger town, maybe kind of in the middle. And so it was still being identified because that particular provider was still on covered entities A's eligible provider list and should have been taken off. So they did have diversion going on because um, items were being identified as 340B eligible when they were actually being seen at a different place. But because it was coming in, it was that provider, somehow it got messed up. You would think the, the location would have gotten it out, but somehow it didn't. Compliance plan, what that's referring to is that your corporate compliance plan includes something related to the 340B program, basically that it's gonna be reviewed any findings or, you know, as you're doing your audits, who is that going to be reported to? How is it going to be addressed? And then the actual transaction review, which would be some, uh, you know, whether you're doing an internal audit or whether you have an external person come in and do that audit, that transaction review becomes important. And this is really what HERSA is going to do um, when they come in. So it's, it's almost a, kind of a roadmap to what you should expect when, when HERSA is looking at it. The next slide basically goes through some of the common deficiencies identified, and we've actually already touched on a lot of those as we were going through those 12 elements of compliance. So this is just a, a good list, a good reminder. So as you're going through these, it's really to you know, critically assess what are you doing with your 340B program, have you done some of these things? Have you checked some of these things? with your? If you do have contract pharmacy arrangements, 
our recommendation is having an outside group look at that, you know, maybe not annually, but at least every other year. The, uh, the guidance that's currently contained in the regulations is very vague on this, but based on what we're seeing as far as some of the findings that are coming out from HRSA on that website, if, if you go too long without having a third party look at it, again, depending on the size, if it's a very large organization with a lot of contract pharmacies, a lot of contract pharmacy transactions, you know, maybe annually they're going to want somebody from the outside coming in or that's what their expectation is going to be. So if you do have a contract pharmacy arrangement is to look at have we had somebody externally look at this and how often do we need that done and that should be part of your policies and procedures. So a couple of other things keeping in mind you need a policy to define a material breach and the procedures to follow if one is found that is in the Apexis template. So a lot of times we get questions because it doesn't say, here's how you should define a material breach. So, but based on what we're seeing in our talk with attorneys who work with the 340B program, um, if you would define it as 5% of purchases, under the 340B program or 5% of purchases per each contract pharmacy or something like that. They like 5%, they don't like 10%, they think that's too high, um, but there is no science. There, there is no number, I should say, that that is published. But what you put in your policy, make sure that's what you're following because that'll be the first step. Um, also keep in mind that a lot of times the reports you get from your 340B software do not contain all the necessary information that's required to complete the transaction review. So you'll want to make sure that you're looking at that because HRSA has, you know, a dozen or so required things they're going to look at when they come in to do that transaction review. Making sure your report or a combination of reports, maybe you have to merge two reports to get all of that information. The other piece, and I said it earlier, is compliance with the 340B program solely rests with you as the covered entity. It's not anybody else's responsibility. And we've seen where 340B, for example, software providers have made a mistake. They uploaded the wrong Medicare codes from the wrong state. And it had been a couple, you know, a couple weeks. And finally, the pharmacist is saying, why are these people being approved as 340B when I know this family's on Medicaid, which you have an advantage of in smaller communities? but it was the covered entity's responsibility to go through and fix all that. So keep that in mind when you're looking at it. I think we're gonna have, and maybe we'll have to do three and four. Yeah, we'll go ahead and do keyword three, which will be compliance. Keyword three is compliance. And then we'll go ahead and do keyword four possible. Keyword number four is possible. Okay. Great. So now we'll go through, it's just, you know, one or two slides here on corrective action plan steps. Our recommendation would be make sure one or two employees of your organization have a thorough understanding of the 340B program. Get them through the 340B University on Apexis. Maybe on an, a periodic basis, they go to some external training. The advantage of having two employees who are, are well-versed, if one leaves, you still have one left. Potentially forming a 340B compliance committee, if you don't have one, the purpose of that, they can track audit results, also help educate individuals in the organization that maybe don't have to be experts, if you will, but need to have some understanding. Carefully review the, the policies and procedures. If you have that information there, make sure that it's an updated policy and procedure and make sure you're following it. Um, I know we come into some places where the audit section says we're going to do all this and when you look at what they're really doing for the audit, it probably makes more sense, but it's not in compliance with what their policies and procedures say for what they're gonna do for audits. Ensure audits are being done on a periodic basis and you're maintaining the documentation. That which is not documented, according to HRSA, did not happen. And so you wanna make sure that those are somehow documented, whether it's paper form or whether it's electronic form. And then ensure audits are being done on a periodic basis, especially on those contract pharmacy arrangements, as I said, 
um, it is really HRSA's expectation that those will be done um, you know, on some type of consistent basis, whether that's every year, every other year, depending on the number of transactions for those contract pharmacy arrangements, especially with the scrutiny on the contract pharmacy arrangements after the GAO report and with what's kind of happening in Washington right now. So we just have a, a few minutes left. So want to make sure if I don't see any questions right now, but if there are any questions, I would be happy to take them. We do have a few that have come in. So let's see here. <clears throat> the first one goes back to the beginning of the webinar. Earlier in the presentation, you mentioned that these discounts can be structured for contract pharmacies. What is a contract pharmacy? Sure. A contract pharmacy would be a retail pharmacy that the covered entity or you, the critical access hospital, would have a contract with. So when a patient has an eligible prescription, they would present it to the retail pharmacy, so ABC Pharmacy in your community, and it would be filled. To the patient, probably don't notice anything unless you have some sort of sharing of the discount arrangement for self-pay or low-income people. But what happens is based on this agreement, the pharmacy, ABC retail pharmacy, would dispense the drug, and then it's identified, usually via a 340B software, SunRx, MacroHelix, what have you, that this was 340B eligible. So it was an outpatient of your facility, it was an eligible provider, eligible service, eligible location, rural health clinic, what have you. Um, and then when it's when the, it comes time to purchase the drug, you, the covered entity, purchase that drug at the 340B discounted price, but it ships to the ABC contract pharmacy to replenish theirs. And with the agreement, what happens is there's a dispensing fee that you, the covered entity, would pay to the contract pharmacy, but you basically get from the contract pharmacy what they would have paid in the first place. So it's a whole bunch of back and forth on the accounting, but what I like to tell people is truly, with a contract pharmacy arrangement, one plus one equals three. And in my example earlier, when I said, you know, say the discounted price that you pay as the covered entity is $50 less, that it's $50 less than what they would have paid normally. So if, if they paid you 150, for the normal price, you only paid $100, but then you paid them a dispensing fee of 20, they made an additional $20 on that transaction, and you made 50 minus 20, you made $30 on that transaction that you would have otherwise not pay, made. So the contract pharmacy arrangement is basically a way to get that $50 discount give you the opportunity to get some of that benefit, even though they go to a contracted retail pharmacy that's not even affiliated with you, but it also then gives the contract pharmacy an, a benefit. They get the extra $20 or whatever the dispensing fee happens to be. I kind of simplified that, but that's the basic premise of how that works. So you would go out and make arrangements with contract pharmacies or retail pharmacies. Walmart does this, Walgreens, CVS, all the big companies do it if you happen to be in a community or near a community that has one of those, or we've even seen it with a local pharmacy. All right, so let's go to the next one. How many months back does HRS audit? Generally, HRSA goes back six months. So if they come out, um, you get a notification right now, they would probably do the period, what would that be? May 1st, October 31st is what they do. So it's usually six months. Okay. If there is no requirement on how the funds are spent, why would we be required to answer such a question? Well, when you look at what the original guidance or the original regulation said and the whole purpose of the program when it was passed in 1992 was to stretch scarce federal resources, blah, blah, blah. And it really is focused on low income and in indigent people because it was initially for safety net hospitals. So these were hospitals that had higher than average um, disproportionate share, so low income and uninsured people. and so to basically 
get it so that the drug manufacturers would, you know, at least accept it, if not buy into it, there had to be a reason for doing it. And it was to allow the safety net hospitals or critical access hospitals, once they were added, to continue to provide services or expand services that they might not otherwise be able to provide. So that that's kind of part of the original guidance. It, it just wasn't as straightforward, but now they're getting it to be more straightforward that you have to track it. Okay, so this question is pretty long. <laughs> <laughs> and if I need to, I can always just send it to you. Um, we are a caught and we are a caught and just signed up for 340B for a hospital for the first time and approved of as 1119. We are planning to start using it for OP drugs and don't have a contract yet with a local pharmacy, but plan to. Our clinics are not in an RHC yet, just a freestanding clinic. Am I understanding you correctly? that it would only be OP drugs given in the hospital OP setting like observation or um, OP visits that would qualify, not a drug given in a clinic until it would be an H, excuse me, an RHC clinic. Yeah, until it is an, a reimbursable cost center on your cost report. And so if you were to change it to be, you know, provider-based rural health clinic, um, and I don't know what your fiscal year end is, but say it's 6.30, so 6.30.19. So if you get it done quicker and get that so that it's on your cost report on 6.30.19, you could register it between July 1st to July 15th to be eligible on October 1st of 19. So if it's a freestanding non-reimbursable clinic, it is not eligible. Those scripts are not eligible. Okay. This one's a little bit shorter than the last one. A, we are RHC affiliated. Let's start that again. Sorry. RHC affiliated with CAW refers to patient to an oncologist employed by an unaffiliated territory center that rents space at CAW for outreach clinic where chemo is prescribed by the oncologist, but the patient is treated in the CAW, is the chemo 340B eligible? And, and, and that, is, that is one of those that, um, a couple of things, it, under the mega regs that were proposed, that would not be, it was very specific that those types of services, if the referring physician was not part of you, was and not an eligible provider, it would not be. However, that did not pass. So one of the things that we recommend based on our conversations with Apexis is that in your policies and procedures, you would include that as you consider that an eligible service because your physician, your provider is actually, you know, doing the chemotherapy in your location. So even though this original script came from outside or the original course of treatment came from outside your organization, that is the understanding is that would be an acceptable 340b drug and those those infusion those are expensive so and the the discounts on those can be very good as well so but you want to make sure that is specifically in your policies and procedures that you are going to define that as an eligible service okay so we have just a few minutes does the contract pharmacy have to be affiliated with your organization I'm not sure what they're meaning by affiliated, but no, it can be a standalone retail pharmacy. You just have the agreement, the contract you have with them would bring them under that contract pharmacy arrangement so that both parties can benefit from the 340B services. Okay, and last question here. For the 5% cutoff requiring self-disclosure of material breach, is that by volume of orders from the wholesaler or by cost we pay? It, it is it is whatever you define it as. Um, generally, I mean, there can be a variety of ways you define that. And unfortunately, the example does not, um, or the template does not give the specific example. What we have seen is 5% of purchases. We've seen that quite a bit. Um, so that would be basically the cost, the 5% of the cost. Depending on the number of contract pharmacies you have, however, um, if you do have quite a few, you might want to narrow it down a little bit because they want it to be, HRSA wants it so that you're disclosing to them 
because that's what you use with material breach. Once you have a material breach, you have to disclose to HRSA that you had this. Um, they don't want it to get so large that you're never gonna disclose anything. So if you have quite a few contract pharmacies, and we see this with some FQHCs, they may have 20 contract pharmacies. And so they may say, if we have purchases in excess of Y at these, at each individual contract pharmacy, they may define it as 5% per contract pharmacy once that contract pharmacy reaches a certain level. It, it really is up to you. But again, you just want to make it so that it's not so high that you end up not reporting anything because that's not the purpose of it. The purpose is if, if you do find something that you're thinking, oh my gosh, this, this is kind of big, we're going to report this and self-disclose. You want it to be at a level that if HRSA were to come in, they'd say not say, why didn't you disclose this? So it is a very nebulous number. I wish I had a better answer, but what we generally will see is 5% of purchases or 5% of purchases by contract pharmacy. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for attending. Don't forget to go to the, let's get to the website and get the, um, your survey entered in so that you can get your credit. And if you guys do have any questions, go ahead and reach out to Renee or myself and we'll get those answered. All right. Thank you, Renee. You did awesome. Thanks. <laughs>